purpose of this panel is to encourage different perspectives. And each of the members of the panel really, now that I would like thinking, represent something very unique. We have uh, different generations, which you know means something, and also people that come from different backgrounds, either from Latin America and the US. And I think that this is going to be uh, represented in, uh, in the perspective that we're going to see. So I really thank you for the short notice and for accepting to participate. Uh, we are going to start with uh, the director of the Center for Latin American Studies and associate professor of political science, Scott Morkinson. Then we are going to uh, continue with Tania Perez Cano, that uh, she's a lecturer in the Hispanic and languages and literature. Uh, then we are going to go with Amaury uh, Perez, who is a PhD student in political science. And then we're going to end it up with Daniel Antoni, who is the Director of International Studies and Intellectual Abuses. So thank you very much. We're going to uh, give you 10 minutes, very short, complete, and then we're going to open up for comments and questions uh, from all of you. Thanks, Angelina. As she said, this is great for us to be able to sponsor this kind of event. And it's always amazing, we were just talking before, how many people come out to hear something about Cuba, you know, a, a small little island uh, off, the, off the coast. If we do something about Russia, or the peace process in Colombia, or you know, Iran even, we can't get this kind of public to come. And it's just amazing how Cuba still holds the, imagine, uh, the imagination of so many people. And it's so interesting to see what's happening. Um, what I want to use my few minutes for is to talk um, about kind of the prospects of reform and what, what Fidel's death might mean. Um, we held a conference here in November 2014 about prospects of reform in Cuba. And this was supposed to be the reform in a comparative perspective. Only one month later, the opening to the U.S.-Cuba opening was announced. Nobody at the conference had any idea that, was, that this was coming. Um, but it obviously was a tremendous change to the world and how, this, how reform was going to be seen. Now, of course, we have this other potentially very big change. We'll see how, how big a change it, it really is. Um, his presence you know, on the scene for more than uh, 50 years, is, um, more, uh, he stepped out of power a decade ago, but his, his presence has continued to be very important uh, beyond just the you know, symbols. It's, it really holds an important sway. Um, it could be a big impetus for reform, reform, but again, we're going to have to wait and see. And the challenge, I think, is going to be in what direction reform will go. John Beverly, who couldn't be here today, uh, said at our conference, you know, the challenge for them is so that, well, he, he now denies that he said it, but I think we have it on video, that, <laughs> that it'll become another two-bit Latin American country. In other words, if they're lucky, they'll get to Costa Rica, he said. And he threw a little expletive in there if I to repeat. Um, but, you know, it's going to be very difficult to maintain the legacy of the good parts of reform and move past some of the challenges and difficulties that they face. Now we have, of course, another wild card is, is the election of Donald Trump. Um, you know, it will he bow to the old anti-fidelistas, as he's talked about, and you know, close down the openings that have, have begun? Or will he open it to build more Trump Towers in, in Cuba? Um, I think either is, is potential, and we'll have to wait and see, but it certainly will put another spin on what the form will look like going forward. Um, based on some of the stuff that we did in the book, um, that's uh, getting very close to being published now, you know, Pitt University Press. Um, we, we ended up talking about a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities that Cuba is facing. The people, I think, in, are, are restless in Cuba. There have been decades of very poor economic performance, even if its education and health systems are perhaps the best in Latin America. Um, it touts its social diversity, its gains for women, its gains for Afro-Cubans, uh, Afro but progress on many of these issues and many other issues, from domestic violence to civil liberties, has been, at best, very limited. Politically, the Communist Party has not changed much. We do a lot of comparisons with other Communist parties. Very centralized leadership, extensive controls um, over society and the economy. There are still big opportunities for Cuba. Um, the uh, free, free trade zone in the Mariel Port area shows uh, very much interest in economic opportunities and economic interest in, in transship shipments. Uh, great opportunities, of course, in tourism that goes up about 100% a year in recent years. 
um, biomedical opportunities, educated and a very educated populace, which will be attractive to, to businesses, um, and perhaps oil, which they've been exploring for, although they haven't found yet. And that's not to mention nickel and some of the other traditional things as well. <clears throat> to, to realize the opportunities that these, um, uh, the economic opportunities, they will need some, some change, as most agree. And I would say that within Cuba, there's been at least a whispering campaign, and certainly a much louder campaign or discussion about this outside of Cuba, um, that they will need changes to realize these opportunities. And with the death of Fidel, that makes that more and more possible. His successor, that his brother, um, has seemed more inclined to um, pragmatism in his changes. Um, but critics have shown, have, have argued that the, that the changes have been very slow in coming. Um, my favorite example that was from Carlo Mace, uh, uh, from Mesa Lago and Perez Lopez's book talks about well, they opened up private businesses to, or private opportunities for um, employment opportunities, but you could become a clown but not become an accountant or a doctor. It you know, shows they're making some attempts but really not going nearly far enough to really make it work. So, why are there been, these changes have been so slow or only half measures, as some people have called them? And I would argue that it's because there's this inherent tension in the society of two different narratives about the island and its history. There are positive emphasis on the, 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 the goals or the gains from the revolution. Um, the, you know, the idea is that they took away the privileges of few to raise up um, the, the, the downtrodden. Um, they brought health care. They brought literacy. And the revolution gave the Cubans honor and pride and dignity in success of breaking the long-held bonds, uh, long bonds of the United States and withstanding the invasionary force um, and the decades-long embargo. Okay, so that's the one side. The other side, of course, is also has something to say um, that there's you know, a very negative side, that they executed the hundreds of people who were on the wrong side of the revolution. Uh, Castro gained opponents domestically and internationally when he nationalized businesses. Uh, turned towards an economic, a communist model, economic model. He gained more opposition when he consolidated his hold on power instead of the promised um, elections. Foreign policy, which included putting missiles in Cuba, forays into Angola and Ethiopia, of course solidified the opposition by the United States government. And finally, after many decades, the long economic, promised economic successes that have really given way to widespread, widespread poverty um, even many of his initial supporters have begun to whittle away, or have whittled away over decades. But these, 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 these narratives have, on one side, generated great divides amongst the people, but I think it's reasonable to also say that many people are, are kind of divided internally, seeing both the positives and the negatives. And is it going to be, the question I think is, is what, how reasonable it will be to favor the changes to maintain the legacy without destroying, but, but moving beyond some of the problems that they've had. So you want to maintain the tangible and intangible successes, but moving to, to, to alleviate some of the problems. The death, Fidel's death, I think, has exposed some of these tensions, um, and also just the general opening, where you see many longtime opponents um, who favor their ability to travel and send money back to, to their families, um, but still have been longtime opponents of the Castro and his regime. In our book, which we call Reforming Communism, um, it was an attempt to consider these narratives in the context of discussing the potential reforms or what the Cuban prefer to call updating. Um, we try to consider economic, political, and social changes in that book using explicit comparisons from many other countries um, in Asia, Eastern Europe, um, Latin America. And part of the thing that we took from the book, that from the conclusions, is that success is not inevitable. People think change, 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 but change does not necessarily mean uh, improvement. Um, the initial conditions that Cubans or other countries that are reforming face um, uh, provide a context, but the policies that the, new country, that the countries put in the reformists are decisive. Um, one example came from Vietnam, where they tried half measures that didn't work, but that led to a new round of reforms which have had more success with one small event. Um, just to sum up, though, Cuba has tremendous opportunities um, for improvement. Um, Fidel's death, I think, is going to raise the hopes of many people, um, but partly um, on both sides. He will raise the hopes for his loudest opponents, 
but also for those who simply want to improve incomes, civil freedoms, um, and, and government openness. Um, some of these challenges, again, are, open, are evident from this comparative context, but others are particular to Cuba um, and Cuba without Fidel. Um, the challenge, again, is for them, is for Cuba without Fidel, to build on his earlier promises rather than on the realities of the current socioeconomic system. Um, maintaining the legacy while at the same time updating the system, however, may, may stand in strong opposition to one another, uh, and this is going to be a great challenge for Cuba. Thank you.
giving all the engineers a better evolution. So um, these two versions of the legacy of uh, the human revolution uh, are pretty much associated with Fidel Castro as a, as a historical leader who uh, embraced on the one hand ideas of social justice. He represents the utopic desire of uh, independence of a national project, but that ended up pretty much uh, failing. Uh, I think it, it, it uh, represents as much this utopic desire uh, as the failing of that uh, utopic desire. Uh, because what happened was like, um, effectively, uh, Cuba was as dependent from the Soviet Union as now is from Venezuela as it was previously from the United States. And uh, one of the uh, first examples of this, uh, of the results of these alternating cycles of pragmatism and ideological uh, uh, drive in the Cuban Revolution was the um, in the 1970s, this campaign for the 10 uh, million of uh, production of sugar, the whole country was mobilized into uh, that, all the resources, and when it failed, it left you uh, not only with the very real uh, realization that that indep economic independence was frustrated, but also it was one of the first realizations of the failure of uh, social and economic product of independence. Uh, that, that's, I think that's why it's, we have these two uh, stark visions of uh, the human revolution and of uh, Fidel's uh, legacy. Mm, for the signs that uh, President-elect Donald Trump is sending, uh, <coughs> He, the first one, the first thing he mentioned after the death of Fidel Castro, he thanked the Cuban American uh, community for his support, for their support. He mentioned the Brigade 2506, who was the brigade who invaded uh, Cuba in uh, Bear Pits. Uh, the signs are received in Cuba with the same rhetoric that in, in, the, in the hard years of the revolution. Uh, they are asking for the United States to reform the Guantanamo naval base, and they are asking for the United States to leave the embargo. And the uh, discourse that I'm seeing on both sides, uh, in light of uh, Donald Trump's election in the United States, is to go back to the hostility to the hard rhetoric of the uh, of the years of the Nixon crisis, and if if actually that is the path that President like Donald Trump is going to take uh, with Cuba, it is going to frustrate <coughs> that opportunity for uh, or at least is going to negatively affect that opportunity for opening the public door in Cuba. Because always the consequence of the hard line of the United States regarding Cuba has been uh, Cuban closing in, uh, uh, an ideological discourse that does never admitted any uh, uh, discussion out of within the revolution, everything outside the revolution, nothing. That has been the result of this um, politics of the United States regarding Cuba. Uh, I, believe that the path for reform in Cuba could lead to an improvement and pretty much try to sell that, to help that, save that legacy of uh, this idea of social justice that is still so strong in, in the Cuban people. Because one of the other side of this contradictory legacy is that effectively after 1959, this, I, this aspiration of social justice, this ideal of equality, of 
uh, access to opportunity for low fuels, that is something very real and that is something that is still impacts the imagination of the Cuban people in the island. Um, and, and that is one of the main confrontation points between the uh, Cubans in the island and the exile. And that is one of the long lasting legacies of the Cuban revolution. How much that legacy is being affected by this fake economic and uh, this authoritarian practices of the Cuban revolution? Well, I think it can be seen again in this stark contrast between these cloud silence in Havana and these uh, celebrations in, uh, by the Cuban exiles in Miami. And as I said, um, it, um, I, my hope is that the Cuban government uh, is able to foster uh, the necessary reforms that for the Cuban people to actually maintain what is left of these ideas of social justice and, uh, and that being uh, swallowed again by the authoritarian tradition, this anarchism uh, that also represents the failure of the so we're prepared to solve the topics raised by the panelists here. I will speak from a social perspective. And um, so I was born and raised in Cuba, and I came to the US when I was 14 years old. I have been in Miami, so I have the opportunity of experiencing these two Cubas, you can say. Um, and I also so I want to share that experience here and, um, and share some opinions. So I just want to clarify that the very fact that I'm sitting here today should speak to some of where I stand on the side of the legacy of, of, of Fidel. And I want to start by, by thinking about what's being left behind. So I was referring to the human economy is in big trouble. Um, the agriculture sector is a mess. The Cuban people lack information technology skills, computer skills. I didn't know what Google or Wikipedia was when I came to the US. Um, that was one of the first things my, my, my classmates in high school were surprised to see me. I didn't even know how to do a basic Google search because basic computer literacy skills are lacking. Um, so the, because the government has tried to create a disconnected society. Um, so I'm going to go back to the school system in Cuba because I've been a student most of my life. Um, and I want to share a little bit of that here and then I want to have some experience in this regard. Um, yes, Cuba has been widely praised for its education system all over the world. But on the other hand, there's a different side to it. There's an indoctrination side. Um, and as a, as a son of uh, distance, my parents were uh, speaking against the government, I grew up in a thinking differently. So it was quite uncomfortable for me to go to classroom and be challenged by all these ideas of what the U.S. was supposed to look like, what the Cuban government was supposed to look like, and not being able to say anything about it, just take it as it is. In addition to that, I knew that I was coming to the United States, and one of the things that my friends cautioned me from a very young age is don't say anything, because it might fall in the wrong ears, and that might get you and us in trouble. Um, and in general, uh, the, the Cuban government also would make us, uh, especially in, in my case where I used to live in a rural uh, province, in Cuba, so our situation is probably different from Havana, for example, which is a big city, but uh, the school would expect us to attend to several political acts, which I hated, uh, and we had to stand in parade and wave flags and cheer and smile, and it was all a facade uh, for propaganda purposes, and I would always try to come with some form of excuse to speak political acts. But the overall idea is that the Cuban education, um, from this political perspective, is not focused on creating innovative free thinkers, but rather soldiers of the revolution that look back in time and try to defend this crumbling edifice. Um, and there's also always a legal emphasis that what we're getting, we hope that this free, this free education, this education is free healthcare, means that we owe something to it. That we are expected to obey to whatever the leader says because these privileges have been given to us. Mm -hmm. So there's no choice in, in this, in this uh, regard. And this propaganda apparatus also takes place outside the classroom. So 
Well, when I left Cuba eight years ago, there were only five TV channels. I don't know if there are more today, but there were five. There were a lot now. There are a lot now? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad things have changed. But when I left, there were only five. And they were all controlled by the state. They were propaganda 24 7. Same thing, radio, a newspaper. You couldn't escape from it. And, uh, and they would constantly refer to, for example, things like the embargo as a, as a mechanism of legitimacy for the problem. But we're still relevant, we're still protecting it from the threat that the Americans represent. Um, and this was uh, a constant uh, propaganda. Now, going to the US, so this is sort of the legacy, the, the, the machinery that Castro is leaving behind is one in which uh, the people are deprived of democratic institutions and, and they feel fed this very narrow perspective of what the world is and what the Cuban government is and what they are expected, in what ways they are expected to, to think. So what are the boundaries of behavior? That's what we, what we are being taught of early education. Um, now this, um, one of the other legacies of Castro, and I think both intended and unintended was to keep everyone out who didn't agree with the system. So you end up with this huge diaspora. Um, and uh, I checked this morning the statistics on, on, on the census website, and there were 1.7 the million Cubans in the United States in 2010, so they should be close to 2 million now. So, it's okay, right? yeah. so that's roughly 20% of the Cuban population if you compare it to the amount of people who live in Cuba. And that is excluding Cubans living in Europe, Cubans living in South America. So you have a huge diaspora. And these are people. Um, who have been exposed to a different values, democratic ideal values, who also have been exposed to a capitalist economy, and who understand it uh, much better than people in Cuba. And when you have such a large number of your people living outside your country, well, guess what? They will have families and friends there. And they will export those values, those ideas, their knowledge of the new, of the new uh, of what the United States is, of what Europe is, of what other countries, back to Cuba, and they will be able to begin to challenge those barriers of misinformation and, and to, to question whatever the government has been telling them over the course of six decades. I should also clarify uh, two things. Uh, this is very important. Uh, there is a generational gap in this Cuban South community. I'll refer to the one in Miami because it's the one with which I have experience. Um, we have older folks who tend to vote Republican, as I mentioned, and uh, they tend to hold a lot of resentment toward the government. And regardless of whether it, or what side you take in this position, I, I understand where they're coming from, because they were the ones who saw their properties being confiscated, their lands nationalized, who lost everything they had, who, saw, who also experienced the, the most brutality from the system, especially in 1960, because many of the family and friends murdered or were executed or in prison and tortured. Um, so I can understand that resentment. Where is that resentment coming from? Um, it might not necessarily be relevant to the current situation, or might in cases be counterproductive. Um, but there is a reason why they behave the way they do. Now, younger folks like me, uh, we were already born into the system. Our parents were, for the large part, born into the system, so we didn't have a whole lot to lose. <laughs> so we, we have a lot to gain on the other hand. So we take a different approach to this. We have two different we, we want the same goal of one day seeing a democratic and prosperous Cuba. But the way we want to get to that goal is different. So we, we reject the embargo uh, because it's really counterproductive. If you go to Cuba, I mean that's a huge piece of propaganda. And it also an international embarrassment for the United States in the diplomatic world. Um, and, and we also uh, are favorable, have a favorable use of our cultural openings and exchange of ideas and uh, we still not tend to be more supportive of Obama's policies of, 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 of closing diplomatic relations with Cuba uh, because it enables, again, it fosters that exchange of ideas. Um, I mean, it's great when, when I think of Americans going to Cuba, even though it's not fully free, but it's more flexible. I mean, your guys are not only uh, you know, enjoying a nice resort in Cuba, or going or walking around the historical streets, or taking pictures of dilapidated buildings before capitalism ruins everything.
so, so what's the main point that I want to make? I mean, in a way, I'm a product of Castro's legacy, if you think about it. Um, and so we have two Cubas running on two different speeds. Now this Cuba in, in exile is, is helping to build momentum in Cuba because people are not blind. They know that the economy is failing, that the economy promises have a failure. So there is a momentum being built in here. And, and there are more, more, more claims for change. And we're seeing now with the current government of Raul, I mean, he's had to you know, loosen up his grip a little bit and start to open up the market. And as these old leaders who have a lot of historic and symbolic legitimacy pass away, the new leadership, which doesn't have, or which will not have, the same type of uh, relevance, historical relevance and legitimacy, will have to, in my opinion, mm -hmm. look up for ways to make up for that lack of legitimacy. Um, so I think that there, there are huge opportunities for change that, that should be coming in the next years, and there is momentum being built. And, and also Cuba and America, I mean, have a lot of disposable income and capital to invest in the island should further economic opening take place. My biggest concern, however, goes back to this lack of democratic institutions. I don't know how this process will be negotiated because there are, because part of the legacy, mm -hmm. um, on one hand, is this diaspora that is backfiring, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, um, by removing those democratic institutions, um, I don't know how, how differences will be negotiated. What, what, what ways is the of change that Cuba and Cuba um, What do they want to preserve in the revolution? And to what extent is that division from the Cuban people in Miami? For many of them also want compensation for the property they lost in the 19th century. So I don't know how is that impractical or feasible or if that actually could be counterproductive for any prospects of, of change in Ghana. Um, so, no, positive and skeptical, no? <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Angelina, for organizing this, this timely panel. Um, I'm going to uh, give some, some brief comments on, on the death of Fidel, uh, and its implications from it a Latin American uh, perspective and, and also pretty much a personal perspective. I, I grew up in Argentina. Uh, I'm going to talk about three topics uh, briefly. First, uh, I have to say that um, on uh, November 25th, no, uh, 2016, I felt that it was that day the end of the 20th century. It came uh, 16 years later, uh, but uh, that was the day in which the 20th century ended. And uh, this is important in, in a number of ways from a Latin American perspective and a, and a personal perspective. First, I'm in my early 50s, and um, I have to say that uh, if you, um, for the most part, are a Latin American um, who has received a, a sort of education, uh, at least uh, at the level of high school or beyond, I would claim that your identity in one way or another cannot be detached from the, the Cuban Revolution. That's, that's part of who we are. Um, and uh, I, I'm, it's very interesting because in spite of the generational uh, difference and, uh, and the fact that we come from different countries, I would I agree with you that I'm also a product of Fidel's legacy. What's interesting is that you said I'm a product of Castro's legacy. And I can't say Castro. Uh, I, uh, and that's, that's a very important uh, um, sort of linguistic element that, that we grew up saying Fidel. Can't say Castro. Castro means something different. Uh, and um, the other thing that is for me, extremely important, and this is both an analysis from a Latin American perspective and a reflection on the 20th century, and it's also personal, is that for me the most important element of the 20th century for Latin America is, without any doubt, the Cold War. The Cold War was not a Cold War in Latin America. The Cold War was a period that resulted in 
thousands or tens, so tens of thousands of deaths, brutality, genocide, that is the most horrific, horrific events that one can think of. And the Cuban Revolution is absolutely central to understand this on both sides, because of course it created the new sort of imaginary, the new uh, drive to search for revolution, and of course it triggered the reaction of the other forces that wanted to counter that revolution. And so in that sense, I think that the death of Fidel is extremely important to go back and rethink, because one of the tasks for us is that we have not yet recovered that history. We have not, we are thinking about the Cold War in Latin America very much in a way that is informed by the way in which others have looked at it. The region has not come to terms with it. And this is something that is absolutely central. And I think that in personally, I've been thinking a lot about this in the last few days. The second topic is that the legacy of Fidel of the Cuban Re and the Cuban Revolution also talks about something which is very important, which is the Latin American left's uneasy relationship with democracy and rights. If we think about the most important achievement of the region since the wave of democratizations that we experienced uh, in, at the end of uh, the last decades of the 20th century has been the great advances in citizenship rights and the rule of law. With all the problems that we can talk about, it's foolish to say that that is not absolutely crucial. Because if we look at the history of Latin America, of course that these advances have been extraordinary. But Cuba is always there as an uneasy point. Because when we talk about political and civil liberties, it's difficult to justify Cuba. And it's a tension. We always live with that tension. That is, we want to justify Cuba and we support Cuba, but at the same time, when we come to the issue of political and civil liberties, we need to kind of say, let's talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> there are other legacies that, of course, connect to the Cuban Revolution that are difficult to deal with today. Daniel Ortega, okay? And so, these are issues that are difficult for the left in Latin America to deal with, to swallow. So that's another very, very important element. And, and, and I hope that given the changes that are going on in the region, we really embark maybe on a more serious conversation about this. And, uh, and it would be complicated because it's inherently showing attention. And I want to finish with the, the third uh, topic that I wanted to mention very briefly and adding a couple of things to what has been said, which has to do with um, US-Latin American relations uh, in the context of um, the death of Fidel in Cuba. The new restablishment of diplomatic relationships and uh, the rapprochement between the United States and Cuba is of course very important for many reasons, but from a Latin American perspective it's very important because Cuba has always been a sore point in the relationship between the United States and Cuba. And dealing with that is a very, very important step in building a relationship with the region. Again, because that's how things are. There is a lot about that has been mentioned in terms, in terms of Scott, I think, mentioned the issues of dignity, for example that are very, very strong in the region and mark that relationship. At the same time, when we talk about, for example, the Cuban-American community, the generational changes are very, very important. If you look at 
recent uh, polls in, in the last few years, the support for the termination of the embargo among the Amer Cuban-American community is very strong. A majority wants the embargo to go. And the most important cleavage in terms of perceptions about Cuba is generation, is age. Um, the question that, uh, of course, it's, it's something very complicated is what's going to happen in Cuba. It is very likely that uh, economic reforms may start to speed up. Um, I don't know about political reforms because that's a more complicated issue. There are actors that are important. Venezuela, for example, the fact that Venezuela is in such a difficult situation is, of course, crucial. And a novelty is that you have important actors like China, and they do play a very relevant role and will play a very relevant role in the future of, uh, of Cuba. To conclude, two things about the legacy of Fidel. First, going back to what Scott was saying, do we want Cuba to become Costa Rica? Well, this is from a Latin American perspective. <coughs> This is something that we don't want to see, and it's so selfish. We still think that Cuba has that special place as a utopia in the imaginary. And to be honest and very blunt, maybe we don't even care. We care, but we are selfish. We want these Cubans invent that for us. Show us that that's possible. Okay, we are still willing to believe, and I think that that's very, very powerful. And I don't know the extent to which the death of Fidel will change that. And it's something that maybe it's generational. I don't know. The second, which is very important, and you talked about Miami, is that Miami is the result of the Cuban Revolution. But Miami is no longer a Cuban city. And Miami is, I'm actually writing a book about that, is a city that shows the rise of a new global city. It's a city that shows a completely new face of the United States. And that's also very interesting in terms of the legacy of the Cuban Revolution. I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you all of you.